<laughs> I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> At least the food part. Like, who doesn't like Italian? All right, and that's what you look like. Oh, right. This one I'm going to pull back a little bit. Hold on, okay. let me just get it just right. I figure about here, and then when you're using your hands and you're talking, yeah, yeah. come in. If I need to, I'll pull it a little tighter. Okay. Good. Ready? We're rolling. <coughs> okay. One second. Wait one second. Okay. Okay. Um, Larry, you've played the Blues Fest here in Windsor now a few times. Um, why do you like to play here? What, what, what is, there, is, is there something special about playing this particular festival for you? Because you keep coming back and they keep having you. Well, I, I think that um, I quite fancy all the Canadian audiences. The Canadian people really are great uh, supporters of music, and in particular our style of music. So anywhere that you can go and find acceptance, it's always a willingness to return to that. So, I mean, you know, Windsor, it's very good. We call it East Detroit because it's just across the river. You know what I mean? This is kind of like being in Detroit City. And the people of uh, Windsor have a very similar swagger, kind of like the Detroiters. You know, you can get your ass kicked over here just as quick as you can across the river, you know. So, you know, it's, it, it, it feels at home. It's, it's a good place to be. Good. Yeah. Um, what about working for Teddy Boomer? I'm sorry. Working for Teddy Boomer. Teddy Boomer. Teddy Boomer is a sweetheart. He's a cream puff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, um, I, I feel that um, my job is to be the best that I can be and to be the easiest that I can be to work with, to not create a problem for the uh, people that uh, you're working with or working for. So, therefore, we um, have experience in being on time, being off the stage on time is just as important as being on on time. You know, just little things uh, that are intangible professionalism that makes things go a lot smoother for you. So if you can abide by those rules, you know, people don't mind working with you. And I try to be a good person to work with and to work for. Great. Um, talking about your career, your first record was Ambition, right? Yes. In 1990 on Virgin. Yes. Uh, can you tell us how you came to get signed for your first major label deal? Sure. Um, I got invited to a musician's party down by uh, Square Lake, somewhere somewhere in that area in, in uh, Pontiac, Michigan, by a single friend of mine at that time. Her name was uh, Shar or and She was quite popular in our area for singing. And so at that time, in the middle 80s, we hadn't really branched out a lot uh, beyond our home region. And we were playing northern Michigan, you know, like in Traverse City and Petoskey, places like that. But uh, when I went to this party with, with my friend, she introduced us to about 300 musicians from Detroit area, you know, southern part of the state that we didn't know. So just so happened this gentleman was there. We played a set, and when we come down, he said, hey, how would you like to record an album? And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, buddy. <laughs> Heard that before, been there, did that, you know. And um, he gave me he gave me a contact. I gave him my number. So he called me again later and said, well, are we going to record? You know, what you going to do? The first time, I just kind of blew it off. The second time, he said, come on now, you know, what you going to do? The third time, he said, you just going to F up everything if you don't get down here. So... With that note, I did. You know, I seen that he was serious, and we went down, and that's kind of was the start of everything right there. But I, I met him at a just a picnic jam party, just a big jamboree. That's, that's great. Yeah. Like right place, right time. That's right. That's right. Um, then your second album, Delta Hurricane. Um, you worked with Mike Vernon. Do you have any stories about him? Well, I'll tell you one thing that I learned from uh, Mike Vernon, and that uh, he was very organized and methodical the way that he approached recording the record. He had his pad and everything, and he would have, uh, you know, everything lined up that he wanted to do in terms of maybe like uh, tracking would be the first thing. Then he would go back with the vocals, 
background vocals, overdub, and as we did this, he checked everything, you know, any glitch that he would hear, anything, he made notes of it, and when it was all said and done, when it was time to make the final mix, he went down and made, proofed his list and made sure that everything was taken care of from page to page, everything was done. So I thought that was kind of interesting how that he dissected it down, where the many times people just kind of listen to the overall thing and not really so focused on itemizing the detail. And Mike was very, very organized that way. Were you familiar with his past and who he had worked with? Oh, I know he had worked with a lot of different different big artists. And uh, I know that he produced uh, Freddie King's Burglars. And that was one of my favorite uh, records as a child growing up. That was one of my main inspirations was Freddie King because uh, he was a big man in stature. He had a big burly voice but and a big guitar. But he also had a lot of finesse and a lot of control and things like that. So Freddie was my man. He was one of my main influences. I loved uh, I loved BB, Albert King, of course, and Albert Collins. Then was the guitar bible for kids of my generation growing up in the seventies. You know, if you couldn't play one of them guys, then you weren't really reaching nobody yet. And of course, everybody uh, flirted with Hendrix. You know, with Jimi Hendrix. You know, when that thing began to get popular. You know. Uh, yeah, you took my next question. About oh, that's okay. <laughs> but I, I'll say this much um, yeah. about uh, Jimi Hendrix. I didn't know who Jimi Hendrix was until I was over 20 years old. And and when I did finally find out that he was a black man, it freaked me out. I thought all the way up until I was in my early 20s. You know, because I was just old enough to hear the talk about it, but not old enough to go to the concerts or to really know about his music, who he was firsthand. Yeah. So when I, uh, the, the, all the guitar I played started out was clean guitar. I never used uh, any effects or anything with my guitar, so if it didn't sound like B.B. King, King's guitar, we didn't relate it as being blues. So when I heard all this powerful rock music and all this stuff, well, I'm, well excuse my expression, but back in them days, we called it white boy guitar because the black musicians that we knew didn't use those tones, it was all clean. And so I'm just so glad that um, I was finally exposed to it. And once I was exposed to it, I went back and did the research, you know, all the way back to uh, Jimi Hendrix, 1960, it was as far as I could go, you know. Right, I mean, but I, Brothers and yeah, Richard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I come to learn about all that about him. So I was really impressed with um, him as a guitar player and arranger also. Everybody speaks about his fabulous lead, but Jimmy was a hell of a arranger and writer, you know, and producer, you know, so a lot of people don't realize that about him, but he was a rhythm maniac, rhythm guitar player. He was hell of a rhythm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, how's it playing all these years with your own brother Steve on drums? How did I go about well, this, this, what's it like, you know, you're in a band and you have your own brother oh. in the band. <laughs> <laughs> Does it cause for any family? Oh, uh... uh, yes, I want to kill him about <laughs> four days out of seven. But, uh, I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we was always uh, tight anyway because we're the youngest, too. But I'm, I'm almost five years older than Steve. So, of course, it was always that sibling rival resentment thing going on like that, but we, we, we work out our differences and um, in terms of knowing my music, I don't think it's uh, any drummer that knows my music better than my brother. And we have uh, visual telepathy where that if I want him to change the mood or change the setting, uh, change something about what's going on, if I give him a certain look, he, he just knows what I want. And, um, I think that that's uh, very instrumental and influential also on my sound because I like uh, funky drum beats. But I also like when uh, a person knows how much to go without overextending the acceptability of the music. And I think also that that's where he has a good niche because he knows the music, but yet still he knows the blues too and know how much that the music will accept without turning into something different. And so that's another thing I appreciate about my brother. I think he's a good, solid drummer, but uh, he knows how to 
blend the, the, the two influences, the funk and the blues together, without taking the blues to such an unfamiliar place. And he probably also knows how to press your buttons. Oh yeah, he's good at that also. <laughs> Very good at that. Okay. Um, last question, Larry. Plans for the future? What's in store for for you? Well, right now I'm um, just about finishing up um, a record of uh, live, uh, not not a live record, but a, a record of classic covers. Uh, some of my classic, uh, my favorite classic covers, such as uh, Bob Seger's Night Move. Um, Born on the Bayou by um, Credence. Credence. Uh, I'm doing um, Greg Almond's uh, I Am No Angel. I'm doing uh, Needle and Spoon by uh, Lynn Skinner. I'm doing uh, Listen to the Music by the Doobie Brothers, but in a real soulful, funky version. It's not, it's the, the strum, the popular strum, is still there, but the drum beat and the bass is on such a different beat. It's, it's kind of different. So I'm hoping, uh, we, we're trying to use the same concept that um, Portland used when they did Painted Blue and had all the blues artists do classic uh, rock rock songs in their own interpretation. So that's that's my goal with this record. And uh, upon finishing this, I'm also doing uh, a studio record right now. So I'm hoping to have two releases at once. Great. All right, Larry. Thank you so much. My friend, thank you. Have a good set. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Outstanding. Okay. Well, that, yes. <coughs>